still morning, I think. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session on the rise of data science, or on some implications of the rise of data science. Uh, so I'm chairing this session. My name's Kevin McConway. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the RSS, uh, which basically means I'm supposed to know about a whole lot of things which are generally to do with what goes on in higher education in universities generally. Uh, and we have three speakers who are going to provide you with a varied view on how we, particularly as academic statisticians, those of us who are, uh, perhaps need to react to what's been changing in our very broad subject area. I checked earlier on today on the UCAS website, if you're not from the UK, that, that's the uh, organisation that uh, coordinates and arranges entry to universities in the UK uh, for first degrees, undergraduate degrees. And for entry in 2016, uh, so about a year from now, uh, there are 10 undergraduate degree courses, bachelor's degree courses, called data science, and another two or three which are called something very similar to that. And most of those didn't exist. In fact, all of those didn't exist up till two years ago, I think it was perhaps one year ago. There are, uh, and that's more than there are single honors degree courses in statistics in this country. Uh, at top postgraduate level, uh, the position is similar, in fact, even more so. They're, they're, they're getting on for 30 top master's courses in uh, data science available, and most of those, I mean, few, a few are either have been running for years or kind of re versions of things that have been running for years, but most of them are essentially new in the last two or three years. Now, if you try to look at the detail of what's in these, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, I mean, there's this whole question of what is data science anyway, that's not very clearly defined. And then what you teach in some universities seems to be what the computer science department thinks <laughs> data science is. In others, it's that plus a statistics module that they dragged in from somewhere. In other places, there's a very good, it seems to me, integrated provision of things that I would want to be taught if I wanted to learn about data science. But it's really unclear what the subject is and how we ought to teach it in terms of teaching and learning. And that's going to be the uh, focus of this session. We've got two speakers from academia and one from business and industry. So we get a different point of view, what's needed from both ends. Excellent. OK. So this is the topic I was asked to address. And I thought the best way to do it was to split it up into these questions which are very much the sorts of questions that Kevin has just posed and at least partially answered. You'll find my answers uh, have an interesting correlation with his. First, if I'm talking about data science, I've got to say something about what it is. And of course, one could easily talk for endless days about <coughs> what it is. But then, a uh, question that statisticians are always particularly aware of, who are you teaching? And then focus down on what should be taught, but also who should do the teaching how should you teach it, the sorts of pedagogical methodologies, and then are there other implications for statistics. So that's the outline of my talk. So let's kick off with an attempt to define data science. It's not really a definition of data science, but uh, an attempt to indicate what I think it, it's about. And I think fundamentally data science has two aspects. One aspect is data manipulation, the other is inference from data. You have to do both of these things if you're going to use data in a sensible way. You have to be able to juggle with it, and you have to be able to determine things from it. The data manipulation aspect is the computer science aspect, is in my opinion, we can argue about it afterwards. Um, so that includes things like searching through data, sorting data, sorting data matching data, organising it, curating data in general, those sorts of aspects. That's the computer science aspect. The inference aspect, the other half, is the statistical <coughs> half. This includes things like summarizing, modeling, predicting, forecasting, inference in general, <coughs> estimating, I'll put up there. So, two aspects to data science, the computer science, which is the data manipulation, and the statistical aspect, which is the inference aspect. Uh, now on to the second part is, who are you teaching? This is a question which statisticians are always happy to confront, academic statisticians always have to face this question because there are a whole, there's a whole range of different kinds of animals that we teach, um, that are diverse audiences. So for statisticians, I split them into three here because I think there are three main groupings. There are those people who are, intend to become professional statisticians, whether they work in academia or industry or medical research or, or, or whatever. 
but people who intend to become professional statisticians. Secondly, we've got people who will use statistics, so people who need to understand statistics. So I've done a lot of work with med medical people, obviously. Most applied statisticians have, but also psychologists, engineers, and, and so on. So these people will use statistics, so they need to understand statistics, but they're not going to become professional statisticians. So there will be things that they don't want to spend their time, don't need to spend their time learning. And then thirdly, we've got perhaps lay people or journalists or something, and these people who wish to understand some statistics so they can make sense of the media stories, so they can critically assess assertions that are made to them and so on. So three classes. And I'm talking about statistics here, not data science. People who intend to become statisticians, who need to understand statistics, and who wish to understand statistics. But of course, I can replace the word statistics in that by the phrase data science. And we've got exactly the same division, I think. We've got the people who intend to become data scientists, whatever that is, or they are, people who need to <coughs> learn some data science, because they're going to be analysing data for their discipline. They're experts in some other discipline, but they're going to be analysing data. In. And then people who <laughs> keep reading this phrase in the newspapers and wonder what on earth it is, and who need to be able to critically assess the newspaper stories and things like that. So the third part is what should we what should be taught in, in some sense this is what this whole session is about but i think it was necessary to go through those earlier parts in order to make the observation that different groups require different materials you're teaching professional statisticians you're not going to teach the same material as to lay people who need to understand newspaper stories so what you're going to talk teach depends who you're teaching so for the first group people who intended to become data scientists they will need the mathematics, the statistics, and the computer science core ideas. Um, if you like, they'll need the advanced ideas. Some of them will be developing, in academia for instance, developing new methodology. Others in industry or whatever will be applying cutting edge methodology which have just, which have just been developed. They'll need to understand the methods, the limitations of the methods, where they can be usefully applied and so on. So that's what needs to be taught to the first group. To the second group, people who need to learn some data science, psychologists or whatever, who are using these things, they need some of the above. Perhaps most important of all, they need to know enough to know when to seek expert help. So they can analyze their data using SPSS or SAS or whatever, SAS or, or whatever. But at some point, they're going to, they're going to make mistakes with luck. They're going to recognize they're going to, they've made mistakes. They will need help perhaps designing studies or, or designing a survey or whatever to collect the data or they'll need help understanding that administrative data, for instance, which I'll say a bit about later, does have errors, even if they're not sampling errors, um, and they need to know enough to, to seek help, to seek advice. Um, they will almost certainly need to know how to use some software, I refer to SPSS and SAS and so on, those are, are sort of important examples. And I think the part I put in italics there, in some sense this is the most vulnerable vulnerable group because they are, and I, you know, I, can, I have examples of this and I'm sure many of you do, people who think they know how to do it, they can throw their data at a statistical package, they can get a result out and to some extent they can interpret the result. That doesn't mean the analysis is valid and that the conclusions are, are, are accurate. And I, so I think this is a particularly, potentially a vulnerable group. Um, and then the third group, the lay people, I call it lay people here, but it will include journalists and so on, who wish to understand the data science. They need the rudimentary ideas, um, and perhaps they need to understand some of the more important basic errors. I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. Like Kevin, I did a quick search of what is taught. I've just said what ought to be taught at a very superficial level, but I did a search of what is taught. And what I found, more or less conforms with what um, Kevin said, what I found was that there are a lot of courses have sprung up over the last few years. There's heavy emphasis on statistics in general. So these are all statistical. If you can't read them from the back, these are all sort of standard statistical sorts of things, including things like machine learning, which I, as you probably know, regard as a, a sub-discipline of, of statistics. So I'll dismiss that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's, it's about inference. It's about <laughs> extracting meaning from data, illumination from data. So it's statistics. So a lot of statistics taught in these data science courses, but also 
some computer science. These are the data manipulation things. And to be a data scientist, you do need to, as I've said at the beginning, need to understand these data manipulation aspects. And I, the things I put up there are databases and relational algebra, parallel databases, and I've put these to MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark, Graph, Giraffe, database, and so on. Uh, statistic, uh, computer science sort of ideas, SQL, no SQL. Something about data capture technologies, perhaps, measurement technologies. And then at the end there, I put ethics. A lot of the courses, and I think this is, is important and good, a lot of the course, a, a lot of the undergraduate and master's courses seem to have a module on ethics. And this is, of course, critically important um, in the modern world, especially in contexts where um, data are used, and in some sense this is the essence of big data, of data science, data are often used for secondary analysis. They're collected for one purpose, and then they go off to be used for something else. They possibly go off to be combined, to be merged, matched with other data sources. And then you get all sorts of subtle privacy, confidentiality, ethical issues coming in. So seeing ethics modules in a lot of these courses was quite encouraging to me. Um, you, you all have ethics courses in every statistics degree taught, but I think not all of them do that. So I thought this was good. I think other things which I didn't see so much of in the courses I looked at anyway were things such as computer simulation, absolutely critical in the modern world and in the modern world of data science, or, or perhaps some data scientists think, well, we don't need to simulate things, we've got a lot of data, but, you know, for, in a lot of applications you do. Um, unstructured data is, of course, critical. The classical statistical set of data is a, you know, is a, is a table of numbers, but of course, increasingly in the modern world, we use what sometimes we <coughs> unstructured data, text, images, signals, things like that. Large data sets do have particular challenges. They obviously have data manipulation challenges. If you've got billions and billions of data points, searching and sorting poses data manipulation challenges. But they also pose inferential challenges. And I think the particular challenges of large data sets need to be taught in data science courses because the number of increasing large data sets being collected and collated is increasing. Interactive data visualization needs to be taught in these courses as well, and I didn't see much of that. And then, particularly important, I think, data quality. This is absolutely crucial. You will probably all have examples of how missing values or misrecorded data or transposed digits or some other kind of distortion has led to invalid conclusions, invalid analysis. So I would like to see explicit modules in these data science courses on data quality and data quality issues. I put an analysis and quality of administrative data there as well because administrative data is different from the data which a lot of us as statisticians were brought up on. We were brought up on data which is collected from an experiment or a survey, but administrative data are collected as a spin-off of some kind of exercise, credit card purchases or, or health education records. So, People sometimes assert that you have all of the data, so you don't need to worry about sampling error and things like that. And that may well be true, but there are all sorts of other kinds of errors which we are not so familiar with, which can creep into administrative data. And I think we as statisticians concerned with inference need to focus some attention, some research attention, on, on, on coming to terms with that so that we can say sensible things about the certainty, the error bounds of the conclusions we draw. We don't have much experience of this at the, at the moment. So data quality of administrative data is, is um, very important. <coughs> and increasingly important because, in some sense, this is the essence of the big data movement. Uh, big data is collected automatically as a consequence of some other activity in, in very many cases. Okay. Part four, who should do the teaching? Well, this is a question that um, as many of you will have encountered in other contexts as statisticians. It's the same question as who should teach statistics because there are two answers to this. Statisticians, professional statisticians, academic statisticians should teach statistics. But the other answer is that practitioners in a, in a particular discipline should teach. So psychologists should teach statistics to psychologists. I mean, they have the advantage of being familiar with the challenges of the discipline. Physicists know what 
problems they've got, what sort of techniques are appropriate, and of course they can give real and relevant examples. But on the other hand, of course, uh, they may not be aware of cutting edge new methods which might be appropriate, and they may well not have a, 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 as good a grasp of the statistical ideas, methods, concepts as professional statisticians. I said here, a weaker understanding of statistics, data science, and so on. So exactly the same uh, applies um, for data science here as statistics. And we've all seen Howlers. Five minutes left. Good. Yes. We've all seen Howlers in statistics sets written by non-statisticians. These are these are some of my sort of favourites. These sorts of things, and I'm sure you all, all have your favourite examples of fundamental errors people have made because they slightly misunderstood things. And it's not it's not just um, you know, you know, the people who make these mistakes will be naive, if you like, lay people, but they will also be skilled professionals in other disciplines. How should you teach it? Depends who you're teaching. Remember those three groups, obviously, including real examples. So I'm talking about data science, but it's the same sort of thing with class to statistics. Real examples, especially for domain specialists, stress on real data. Data science, fundamentally a practical discipline. There's a question of whether it should be called data science or data technology or data engineering. So very much practical, and obviously one needs practical projects. And then are there other implications for statistics? Um, you know, the question we have all been sort of wrestling with over the last year is, um, is there a risk of computer sciences taking over? I don't think there is. I think there's an analogy with bioinformatics. When bioinformatics grew up, it was primarily, initially, computer science driven. But then they realized it was really all about inference. And who knows about inference? You do. The statisticians do. Um, so you need a statistician. So I don't think this is a real danger myself. That's what I've just got my eyes closed. <laughs> but typically, uh, it, uh, it overlooks computer science. It's typically overlooked data quality issues, which I will keep coming back to. I was going to conclude with this example of um, uh, a paper which attracted a huge amount of attention, which purported to show that you could predict movements of the financial markets by um, looking at Google search trends. A lot of searches meant people were uncertain, sell, so you sell and, and, you, you, and, and a few searches, people were certain, you buy, you could make money. And they did a t-test to show that this is the case. I'm not going to go through an example. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say they were wrong. <laughs> if you just look at the number of degrees of freedom in their t-test shows they must have used the wrong t-test. They confused fixed and random effects. Statisticians are absolutely vital for this. Having a lot of data, just being a data scientist, isn't adequate. You really do need to understand concepts of inference. And I'm sure Kevin is going to hold up the sign saying, stop, so I'll stop. <laughs> 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 Questions or comments on this? Um, a lot of the programs at least in the US for data science are constructed by non statisticians, and I find a lot of the content focuses on just sort of plug and play without yeah. learning about the inference or the assumptions to actually use the test. What would you suggest that statisticians do to try yeah. to fix that? Because it's a little scary to see people going out using all sorts of very advanced techniques without understanding when is a good time to actually use it. Yeah, I, I, I think, I actually think this will solve itself, like bioinformatics, when people realize that uh, the people who have learned those skills haven't really got enough to be able to do something useful with the data. I mean, my sort of classic example of this is computer science database people who are interested in making assertion statements about what's in the database. But most problems are not concerned with what's in the database. They are problems about infer making inferences to other populations, making a statement about the future. So you do need inference. I, I actually think this problem will sort itself out. But nevertheless, uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't sort of encourage it by sort of saying, ah, oh, yeah, but you don't. You, know, you, you need more than this. You're trying to make a statement beyond what you've got. Um, what was in your second talk? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be honest here. <laughs> well, I don't have to, but I will be. Um, I sent them my slides, and then I, re then I read the information requesting, telling me how to send the slides, which said you've got to name the file this way. So I named the file, 
and, and rename the file and send it to them. So it's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the comment I was going to make is, I mean, my experience so far is that computer science has taken over data science. Uh, as kind of a done deal, and statistics is seen as a small branch of it. Um, but if you want to employ a data scientist um, within a company, um, what, what a company is looking for really is the perfect candidate that, that knows about everything: extract, transform, uh, transform load, you know, data visualization, modeling, and everything. And that person doesn't exist. Um, so data science is sort of a spectrum, and, and really you, need, true, you yeah. need people skilled in all of those aspects. Some will, some will be very heavily technical and at the computer science end of it, and some will be the statistician. But I think there's a real danger that um, you know, a statistician won't be considered as a data scientist. Um, and I think that's what the Royal Statistical Society has to tackle, in kind of embracing <coughs> data science and embracing those other aspects yeah. within statistics and within the qualification of being a statistician. Yeah. I, I I'm not so worried because of the analogy with bioinformatics, which started as a computer science, is now <laughs> recognized as you know, very, very heavily statistical. But your point about a range of expertise is absolutely certain. You're, you're going to have people who call themselves data scientists, some of whom know very little statistics, but a lot about the data manipulation computer science aspects, and other people at the other extreme. So there's inevitably always going to be a range. Of course, you get this range within statistics itself. You get this range within computer science. I mean, you talk to people, some person who's an expert on compilers, they know nothing about databases and so on. Yes. I'm not worried either, but I don't think we can keep being complacent. And I think we need to really push the model for integration of disciplines and be, be embrace data science rather than sort of see it as a... Oh, I, I agree with that. Um, but, but, I, but I think just to consider what I mean, I say in my presidential address, and I'll, I'll restate it tomorrow, but that, that we, um, as disciplines, uh, as a discipline, I think we thrive by interacting with other disciplines. Yeah. In that sense, I think the, the interaction with computer science that's now happening is no different to the interaction with agricultural scientists that happened in the 20s, biological scientists later with medics and so on. And, and you know, it, the integration of statistics and computer science is the challenge of the early 21st century, just as 50 years ago with integrated statistics and biology. Yeah, yeah. It's a very close analogy. Yeah. I was talking to Roland earlier, and I agree about the, the need to push our sort of role in this. And I think in particular the Royal Statistical Society needs somehow to find a way of raising a flag yeah. and saying we, we have this important role here and needs to promote that and, and raise awareness of it. Yeah. And not wishing to steal the third speaker's under, are, are very strong, the discipline is very strong involvement in the Turing Institute is a very positive signal that it's not just about computer science. Yeah. Yeah. Right, time for one more. Chris? Yeah, I want to re this. A lot of it is about sort of perceptions of decision makers, people who are hiring people, yeah. what they think. Yeah. Um, um, and I, the, the rise of all these programs is because data science is sort of an idea you can sell right now and get new resources. And those resources come at the expense of something else, and sometimes that can be us. Um, and also some other things that are happening, like a lot of the things you put on your data science or your computer manipulation type list, people like Adley Wickham are making, making these things really easy and are now. So instead of being sort of, you know, I've got a little phrase to say, you know, today's complex programming types are tomorrow's mouse type. And, um, a lot of these things then have to be in the armory of statisticians because they're easy to put there. They're becoming easier and easier to put there. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, can everybody at the back hear me? Good. Well, somebody's waving. At least three people are waving at me. Uh, the first thing to say, actually, is thank you to Kevin and the organisers for inviting me. The second thing to say is probably what Peter's just said and the gentleman just to his right has just said is about half my talk, actually. <laughs> um, so I've obviously clearly got something that's, that's worth talking about. But firstly, what I am going to talk about is just to outline my background. Kevin's given a very top-line view. My view of what's going on and what we need to teach as a discipline, as a subject, will be different because of my background. Then I'll talk about data science as I see it. And bearing in mind, this is from the, um, the, the perspective of somebody who's a practitioner dealing with real-life data sets with real-life clients who have data sets and they want answers. 
They're not bothered often about the, the technical way we get to those or the data sets or the messy nature of the data. Then I'll talk about the skills I'd like to see. It would be presumptuous of me, who's never worked in academia, to tell you what you have to teach, but these are the skills I would like to see coming out, if you like, from, that, from, from the universities. And the order there of softer skills, and I'll come on to what softer skills are, in front of statistical skills is deliberate, because in a commercial environment, you need to be able to communicate. It is possibly the most important thing, and I'll describe why, and I'll try and conclude um, with some final thoughts. Some of what I say also uh, will cross what David has said. Kevin's told you some of this. This is basically, apart from two years working at the Royal Mail, <coughs> trying to optimise its mail delivery network, for all of my career I have worked in the private sector. I've never known anything else. For the last decade and a half or so, I've been a consultant. For the last seven of those years, I've been running my own business as a consultant. And it's all about, we have a data set. It might be big, it might be small. How do you define big? How do you define small these days? But it's about how do we use this, this data set for our business to enhance what we're doing to make better decisions. So that's my background. Before I carry on, can I just ask, please, is, is there anyone else from the private sector here? working for a public company, or so we have a handful, more than I was expecting. But could you also raise your hands if you're, if you're from academia more generally? OK. The people who are sort of, I don't know why, there's a cluster here. <laughs> <laughs> what does this say about my predictive skills? You will probably recognize some of the things I'm talking about. I hope it resonates. Uh, for those who are um, academics, I hope this actually adds something from a completely different perspective. Um, my only association with uh, really academia has been working with David and, and Kevin while I was doing my PhD. Uh, but my starting point is, I don't care what we call it. If I look back a few years ago, it was big data, it was big data analytics, it was data mining before that. It's the same fundamental problem. We have data sets, we need to analyze those data sets. End of story, really, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And as certainly as far as my clients are concerned, the name is irrelevant, actually, but there are, I might, because of that, take a slightly wider view of what statistics is, what statistics ought to cover, which covers some of the things that Peter mentioned. Um, because coming from my background, which as I say is entirely about uh, helping people, clients, get the most out of their data, data are the most important part of statistics. Fundamentally that's it, whether you call it data science, whether you call it statistics, what else? whatever else. Uh, if you haven't read Bryman's famous paper, The Two Cultures, statistics starts with data. I agree with that. Bill Cleveland said something very similar the same year. Um, Tukey actually go back more than 50 years. Tukey said much of the same sort of thing. So at least I have some sort of um, idea that I'm somewhere along the right lines. However, 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 and this is something I think that is different about statistics and uh, undergraduate master's teaching. Uh, the big defining thing, feature about uh, data science as it's become known is massive data sets. Huge data sets. I didn't know what number to put. 10 to the end observations where any is possibly <coughs> much greater than. I could have put 12, 99, any number in there. But it's big data sets. And the problem with those big data sets is has been facilitated by modern computing power. We can now do things with data sets we could not have done in the past because modern computing is so cheap. Uh, what that, of course, means is, and this touches on something that David mentioned, um, I didn't have the nerve to put machine learning as a subset of statistics, uh, but I know David's publicly expressed that view before. But other, other disciplines, they have, the, they have the computing power. Computers are their lingua franca. And they have big data sets sitting on those. And I think if we're not careful, Peter's point, I think, was that we need to communicate. Because the, the big data sets are sitting with these sort of people. We need to engage with them. We need to know something of what they do. Um, I don't know if any of you subscribe to the KD Nuggets Knowledge Discovery in Databases um, blog. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, the link disappeared off the bottom. This is from the 12th of August. Somebody wrote a blog on there saying, what are the components of a successful data science team? <clears throat> uh, there were three. I don't see a statistician mentioned there. Um, 
if you actually look at some of the characteristics that are needed by the individuals in those components of the data science team, the blue emphases are mine. I think those are core statistical <coughs> skills. We need those as statisticians. Capturing the data, the most fundamental thing, actually, I particularly like the bit, the data engineer does not need to be very academic. No, so please. I spend probably 90% of my life cleaning data, preparing data, um, because data are messy, they're horrible. And the fact that we, we spend so much time invest, or so little time investing on collecting the data gives problems later down the line. David's explained some of those. Um, the machine learning expert at least has a statistical background, according to KD Nuggets. Um, the business analyst, exceptional analytical skills, but really this is my starting point. We need to talk to all of these groups of people, otherwise we will be excluded. And part of this is about language, and I'll come back to that, the language we use. So, um, before I talk about the skills we need, for those, the vast majority of you who, who aren't uh, in private companies, what we need is, basically, companies want answers that are timely, practical, and useful. And there's a massive difference between practical and useful. Practical means I can do it, I can implement what you found. Useful means it makes me some money, basically. Um, sorry to be, so if that sounds slightly cynical to the academics in the audience, that's basically what commerce is all about. We make money, we reinvest it, we make more money. Nothing particularly wrong with that. However, companies have mountains of data, little time to do the analysis, and the reason there's little time is because of commercial pressures. Today, if you introduce a new product, six months later, somebody will have copied it better than you. You need to move quickly. And six months, actually, these days is, is really a lot longer than is needed for some, some companies. They also have relatively few skilled analysts. So, add all of those together, before I start, start talking about the skills we need, this echoes David's point. Statistics must be taught as a practical subject because our clients want answers. Now, I appreciate that many of the people you'll be teaching will not go into um, the private sector, will work in research institutes or whatever. We all have clients. They're just different clients. Their motivation might not be making money. Their motivation might be finding a new cure for a disease, but whatever. Statistics is a practical subject, and it must be taught as, as such. So why are the core skills, the softer core skills, so important? Essentially, it's because I've seen too many good analyses go nowhere because the statistician couldn't communicate with a non-statistician. It's a real fundamental problem I think we have. We have to teach people to communicate. We have to be able to influence, I'll come on to that, and use appropriate language. By which I don't mean we shouldn't swear at the client. We all want to do that from time to time. We need to use the language that the client will understand. That's, that's the most fundamental thing when we're dealing with others. Um, and also, um, I'm not sure really that this commercial awareness is much softer, but it's, a, it's, it's how do I fit in to a company? How do I work with my non-statistical colleagues? Because you will often find yourself working either independently because you're the only statistician on the project, or as part of a non-technical team, you need to explain to those people what we're doing, why you're doing it. Um, and I don't know how you teach this. If you want to express it in statistical terms, it's about estimation, it's about error bounds, it's about likelihood, it's about probability, possibly. But it's common sense. Does this answer that I have got from this huge data set make sense? Because really, that has to be your final filter. How do we teach people to have some sort of common sense or estimation skills? Um, <laughs> I want to spend a bit, about, a bit of time talking about these two. I've been doing this sort of job for um, rather many years than I care to think about, actually. But one common feature is we need to sell the analysis. I will often be talking to somebody who needs to be persuaded. Why do they, they need to invest this money in this project to do this thing that I'm suggesting is a good idea? So we need to sell our analysis. We have to be able to influence. We can't just say, here's a report and then walk out of the door. We have to communicate, we have to engage. Engage in debate at senior levels. Often I happen to deal with um, board level directors. They can be challenging. They know their own businesses. They don't know the statistics. But I need to find out about, enough about their businesses and their motivations and do it very quickly. Typically, I'll have 10 to 15 minutes, if that to convince. So I haven't convinced or given enough to convince within 10 to 15 minutes, I've lost it. 
Um, and all this is particular but bear in mind with statisticians. They can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> I wasn't involved at the start. Can't do that. Do not ever just say that. Always have something positive to say. Don't just say, can't do that, because it's just it's the easy response. It only gets us out of a lot of trouble, potentially. Always have something positive to say. Um, this is also important. Find out about your client. Know your client. Use appropriate language. What is the language of their business? And absolutely avoid statistical jargon. I've given a few examples there. If you say error <coughs> in front of a non-statistician, that means mistake. And you've got a problem to get back from that mistake, which is not a mistake in the first place, but because you used a term that the client thinks is a mistake. Uh, normal is fairly obvious. Um, it might be statistically significant, but it's not useful to the business. Which sort, sort of significance are we talking about? Um, I sort of assume when I come across recently qualified analysts that they have some core skills. And I might be completely wrong because of the, the, the relatively small number I meet. But I, what, I'm, what I'm guessing they come out of university with is some of what I call the core statistics, statistical skills that David has listed, for example, so inference, sampling, and so on. Um, but what I'd also like to see is experience of messy commercial data sets. And the reason I say that is exactly the same as David did. They will be big these days, however we define big. Um, we need strong exploratory data analysis skills, and I'll come on to that in the next slide. But at, but at least we must have that. We must teach people about programming. I'm assuming everybody learns R. Kevin. I'm assuming everybody learns R today. Um, but I'd also like to see if you have a data set of a few million rows, it doesn't have to be that many, every statistical test <coughs> that you'll find in an undergraduate text will produce a significant result. Job done. Uh, so what are the limitations of those? Just an appreciation of the nature of big data, basically. How would you find big data? And then um, David's already mentioned some of these. Use them where they're appropriate, but learn to code. We can no longer not learn to code. Uh, and I'd actually argue that coding is better than using a GUI, but that's my particular prejudice. Um, so you take all of that. What does that where does that leave us? So conceptually, where are we? we've got people who are qualified now. Um, for me, the, sort of a, a guiding rule is, as explained by George Box almost 40 years ago, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. I would also add, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, and they might only be useful for a week or two. So know when that week or two actually happens to be. Um, exploratory data analysis. Tukey made this respectable for statisticians back in 1977. And actually, uh, Anthony Unwin's just written an excellent book about graphical data analysis. In the commercial sector, draw good graphs. Clients, people, non-statisticians will, will accept happily complex graphics if they explain the story. You need to do that. We need to develop those skills. And one of the reasons is actually because of the exploratory data analysis nature of what we're doing. So, um, from a commercial point of view, and again, this seems awfully presumptuous, simple is better than best, often. By the time you have spent weeks, months, years, if it's a PhD project, Developing the theoretically best model, it's too late. I can guarantee that in today's environment, it's too late. We need to teach people some way of assessing that the model, that the statistical model they're getting, is it any use? Can we do anything with it? The practical application of, and the basics, because of the messy nature of the data, because we have to look at the data, we have to present to the client the data as we're seeing them, together with whatever graphics we want to use. The basics are crucial. So exploratory data analysis, David's already mentioned data quality, the whole issue of data cleaning. Often the computer scientists will think you can fix all data errors just with a few simple routines. Or we can automatically clean that, we can automatically clean that. My experience would say that if you automatically clean a big data set, you will introduce as many problems as you've just fixed, actually. Automated data cleaning is often not the message. And then crucial is visualization, graphical presentation. For those of you who are in this room for the last session, uh, the GeoLab at uh, UCL. Uh, doing some amazing things with visualization, really worth picking up on some of the stuff on their website, but crucial because clients, 
it's much easier to explain a complex data set with the right graphic, if we can just find that. So graphical visual visualization skills are crucial. So in conclusion, um, the skills needed are, and again, this is deliberate, I assume the technical, the statistical skills are there. I want to see the ability to communicate, the ability to influence, <laughs> knowing what language to use at what time, common sense, the ability to manage time. Um, I've sat around several tables with commercial clients and academics trying to negotiate PhD projects, work placements. When, a, when an academic says, well, a typical PhD project is three years, I mean, there's just a deathly silence, or people are falling off their chairs with laughter. <coughs> three years, more like three weeks in a commercial environment. How to manage that time, how to manage your time also, things like how, going on how to be a better people manager, of course. Uh, and the ability, fundamentally, the ability to work with non-technical colleagues. So really, finally, um, the statistics and the modelling must be strong skills, but they must be tempered by all of the things sitting above, above there. So the communication is almost, it probably is as important as having some of these. Um, we also need to be, to bear in mind that the commercial utility is really quite crucial. Can my client use this analysis? Because if not, I've probably just wasted my time. And I also finally mentioned uh, coding in whatever language, whatever language is appropriate. Because like, I guess, like, like many of you, I use R all the time. But sometimes R is not the best choice. It's a good language for lots of things to do with statistical, um, any statistical routine these days. But sometimes um, how do Python might be better. So I hope that's been interesting. Uh, I hope it struck a chord with those who work in the private sector. I hope it's been of use to those of you who are in the academic sector. But I like to see these skills. And actually, the ones above four, well, four and above, are as just as important from my point of view of the, the technical skills that I know we all want to teach, or I'm guessing we all want to teach. Thank you for listening. Um, I think there's time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's a bit of time for questions. And luckily, the third speaker's turned up perhaps before the presentation. I'll just explain the strange position that in a masterpiece of timetabling, our next speaker, Sophia, we're scheduled to talk She's giving two talks in the same session at the same time. Uh, we did manage to reorganize things, but we couldn't reorganize the sessions. So Sophia has just come from giving a talk about networks. So to give her a time, do, do you want to get your thing set on there? So we'll take, we'll take a few questions. So Chris. It's a little bit unfair, I suppose, with your session. But if you're doing this talk to the science of the Sorry, if I was going into computer science... How would you change it? If you were in a computer science conference and doing a talk like this, what, what would you change? Oh! <laughs> um, probably to try and give them some caution that just because they have a data set that's on their computer that they can handle. Um, my experience of dealing with people who are in the computer science world is that they're very good at telling me what their database will do with their data. I don't want to know that. I want to know what needs to be done from a statistical point of view. And I'd probably approach it from that point of view. You have these data. How good are your an analysis skills? What do you know about inference? What do you know about data quality? Not in quite that bold way, but try to find some ways of saying, to get them to realize that they need to work with us, as well as the fact that we need to work with them. So it's, it's more about what are we going to do with the data? And trying, ideally, the best way of, of doing this sort of thing is to get a data set from the computer scientists you're talking to, find some errors in it, and ideally one or two that they haven't found, or those that would have some sort of influence on the analysis, because it's much more powerful <coughs> at point about talking to people in their own language, talking to the computer scientists about what has generated this particular error. So for example, um, I came across one where the uh, programmers had arranged a data set that was had a, a human entry entered date of birth, and they realised that um, we can we can force people we can force the key keying operators to enter six digits, um, but actually we're going to make sure that they can't enter zero 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 zero. But there are an awful lot of people who were born on the 11th of November 1911. So it's things like that. <laughs> yeah, it's things like that because they hadn't thought about 11 11 11. And obviously 22, 22, 22 is not a, a valid month, a valid date. So it's, it's 
things like that. But again, it's in this case, the computer scientists are the clients. So it's what, what is their motivation? Because typically, they seem to me to want computers that will run faster or will shave seconds off this algorithm. Well, actually, that's not important. If it takes another 10 minutes, I don't care if that algorithm is better than that. And it's to be to talk to them in that sort of way about what we're trying to achieve, rather than necessarily what your computer can do. I hope that has in some way answered your question. Other questions? Yeah. So, um I agree with just about everything you said. Well done. I've got one thing I think is missing, and it may be my background, so I work for TSK mainly on biological problems. Right. It seems to me that design of investigations is still central and not sufficiently appreciated. And neither of you has mentioned it, so I thought I'd ask what you thought about it. Um, it's probably a question, actually, I'm not trying to avoid this, but better directed to David. I, I will say something about it. Yes, the reason I don't talk much about it is because all of the data sets I see are what's sometimes called administrative, sometimes called found, sometimes called opportunistic. They're presented to me, so I rarely have a chance to get involved in the specification of, but I would agree entirely. Um, it's just too easy now. Data sets are collected all over the place for all sorts of purposes. Just to say, oh, we have a data set, let's do something about it, without actually thinking about the provenance of that data set. And you're absolutely right. Yes, it's something we need to consider, but I like, yeah, it's a limit to what we can do this morning. But I agree, it's, it's very, very important. Any more? Um, so you mentioned earlier that people from academia have been working on this for a long time. And Uh, communication as a statistician if you, that's assuming if you want to consult part-time I assume you have strong statistical modeling inference skills then for you it's the communication learning about um, clients trying to get involved actually as soon as you can because one of the reasons actually and I didn't cover this one of the reasons that statisticians find it so easy to say you can't do that is because the statistician isn't involved till several stages into the project by which time the question being asked cannot be answered from where you, you now are. Uh, so it's, it's about communication, learning about how to talk to people, specifically how to stand up in front of an audience like this with people who know their business backwards, and they will spot the business flaws in what you've just said. So how do you, uh, how can you communicate? It's essentially like being at a seminar with the worst professor you're talking about, his or her specialism you've ever come across. Because I'm thinking, at the back of my mind, one of my clients is the managing director, European managing director of a, a middle-sized company. And he is very sharp and very fierce. He knows nothing about statistics. But over two or three years, I've learned about what he really wants to see. And it's about that me being able to communicate with Charles. So when he fires a question to me, I, because of my analysis of the data, I've thought about how I'm going to frame my answer which almost it never involves log transformation or standard errors or significance because he doesn't want to hear about that stuff. But it's about communicating with, with Charles and forming some sort of dialogue. Because the other thing about, and this is similar to an academic seminar, the other reason it's good to stand in front of an audience like that of professional cynics who know their business better than you ever will is actually you can learn much more about the next task that you will hopefully be invited to do. So that communicate, not fumbling, not stumbling, just be a fluent communicator in non-statistical language. Absolutely critical. You know, just really don't use significance, normal, error. If you're talking to an accountant, don't use variance, because for an accountant, variance means something's in, something entirely different. So it's the communication side, I would stress. So my talk, well, I'm at a disadvantage, because you've all heard David's talk, and I only heard half of Gordon's talk. <laughs> uh, so hopefully it will have some connectivity to what they said, despite this uh, disadvantage. Uh, so when I was asked to speak about this topic, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to stress before I get started is that there's also kind of a third element, which is not academia, and it's not the private sector. Uh, which has really started to understand that they also need data science, and that's the government and third sector organization. And it's very interesting to see government getting itself organized in this area because they get very excited because there is the possibility that they can involve citizens in more of its activities, i.e. enhance democracy, basically. So I think 
data science has a huge potential in doing better science, it has a huge potential in improving profits, but it also has a huge potential in transforming society. And it's easy to get cynical and blasé and say, oh yeah, that's all very well. We've always said that technology is going to advance life for us all, but there's also the potential of improving democracy right, through better usage of data science. And perhaps on a third stage, we I, uh, here in the end bit, where, where there was discussion of experimental design and its importance, I think what people who come with my type of background really are at the supreme <coughs> disadvantage is we don't have as much, much expertise of um, experimental design for ethics. So I, I work a lot with physical scientists. And in physical scientists compared to you know, uh, social sciences, psychology, even medical sciences, we don't have a stronger background in thinking about ethics and data collection that's ethical. So that's, that's definitely a big challenge that's facing us. And then once we have collected that data, of course, putting data sets together, worrying about data protection and what you can uncover in these data sets once you have them, is also a huge issue, uh, and which I meet in my uh, one of my many jobs uh, quite a bit because people will come to me part of the projects that are under the Big Data Institute and say, oh yeah, these, this partner, whatever partner it is, they just want to send all their data over that they've collected. I can just get it on a stick and then do something with it. <laughs> and uh, I usually have a heart attack and faint at that stage. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to just take a few minutes to do a, a little bit of free advertisement before I, I get into a little bit more of the discursive aspect. Uh, so given you're all interested in data science and big data, uh, we have a conference series which happens annually. Um, and see, David reappears. There's the correlation or something going on. It's very funny because the organizer of the previous section uh, appeared in the, in, in the scientific committee of the conference when I explained this one. So there's high correlation. If you're interested, we're still accepting abstracts until the 26th of September. And last time we had 200 people coming, and we also have an embedded industry event. Uh, so go and have a look if you're interested. Uh, it's a very nice occasion last time. And I'm going to skip that one because we're not talking about networks. So you might ask yourself, why do we care about data science and education? Why do we care about data science at all? Well, it's, it's, it's been said so many times you can almost not repeat it again. But there's just more instances where data is being generated and needs to be analyzed. And it might sound trite, but where it becomes important is especially in settings where people are not used to collecting large volumes of data. Companies which previously could be low tech, but which now need to tech up and understand their customers in order to make a profit. And the biggest challenge in such setting is of course, how do you hire when you're trying to hire an expertise that you're hiring in because you don't have it. Um, so it's definitely a big problem that's facing a lot of people in society. And why do people in academia think it's interesting? Well, obviously our interest is we can trick more students into doing maths, which is beautiful. <laughs> and once we trick them into doing their first degree, we can probably trick them into a PhD, which is really wonderful. <laughs> uh, so uh, usually the thing that's repeated is when we're trying to trick people into doing that is to emphasize the point that being a statistician, um, <coughs> this is Hal Ryan, or being a data scientist, which is now becoming even sexier, is obviously the sexiest job to have and you have the highest salary. And if you check uh, sort of graduate salaries, data scientists seem to get a, a kind of a key advantage compared to what computer scientists on their own used to get. So that's why. So what is this? So I asked David if he was going to define data science, and he said maybe. Did you define data science? <laughs> a couple of slides. A couple of slides. <laughs> OK, so one of the key issues in this space is that data science has an identity crisis. It doesn't quite know what it is, right? So sometimes it's math, sometimes it's stats, sometimes it's psychology, sometimes it's computer science. And if you start to think about educating people in these areas, you can't just add more and more material and say people need to learn 
all of these areas in order to contribute, because you can't have a syllabus that's everything in all of these areas. So the question to ask yourself is, is there underpinning coherency? Can we think about other areas to become quantifiable and really learn from how they took advantage of other fields? In a question, is that a question at the back? Yeah, let, let me ask Kevin a question first, because um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, uh, a few years ago, Kevin um, chaired a, uh, a panel which wrote a report for the Royal Statistical Society on the training of statistici statisticians. And if my recollection is correct, he came to the conclusion that there weren't enough being trained in the UK for the sustainability of the discipline. So what I'd like to ask him is how things have changed. Have they changed for the better or the worse in the context of the modern world of data science? Um, yeah, well, that was only part of that report, and uh, part of what David said actually relates to another previous report, but nonetheless, uh, the, the kind of point was there. I think the trouble is that this is a really difficult question to answer, um, because so many statistical jobs are done by people that don't label themselves as statisticians. Now, on the one hand, there's a, there's a lot of recent work. There have been recent studies by Nesta, uh, the think tank uh, by, um, what's it called, the Tech Partnership, the thing that used to be the um, sort of training oversight organization for, for computer science and so on, that say there is a horrible shortage of people in data science, and this includes people with statistical skills. Um, on the other hand, an interesting part of what I did that, in that report, which was actually the, the, the least polished, I only did it because I felt it was important to say something about this, uh, was going to talk to the recruiters. Now, uh, this work was done in 2011, uh, you know, so it was finances, I mean, the general economic situation, this was in the UK, wasn't, wasn't as good uh, as it is now. It was better than at the time of the crash, but really not that good. Um, and I asked these recruiters uh, whether they were having difficulty finding people to fill, fill the post. And they kind of said, well, no, there's a balance. Uh, you know, there aren't as many jobs as there were. So we're managing. But they did express worries about the future uh, when the economy picked up a bit more. Now, I haven't gone back to them and asked whether they're actually having problems recruiting people or not. I mean, maybe those of you who work in commercial areas would know more about this. This thing I, do. Uh, I mean, the other work which I didn't do, which was to do with whether there were going to be enough, enough academic statisticians in the future, was also came to a rather gloomy conclusion. Uh, the report that was done um, by um, the International Review of the Mathematical Sciences, the DPSRC, did in 2010, was really rather gloomy about whether we're going to train enough people in this country to take over from the likes of me. I retire next year. So. Uh, and, um, I'm not sure that position's changed. Uh, anecdotally, it's still pretty hard to fill senior academic posts in statistics. And what anecdotally, one reason that's given for this, I have no idea how general this is, is that there are so many other opportunities for people with those quantitative skills, uh, you know, to, to, to caricature it, but probably not much. They can go and earn a lot more working in the city, perhaps working for a pharmaceutical company, even in some ways working for government, than they can uh, being an academic. So the, the, there are problems, um, and the problems are being pointed to particularly from the point of view of data science. I, I think that's interesting because I don't think it's so specific to data science. I think it runs across statistics as a whole. Um, but I wouldn't like to say how big the problem is because it's really difficult to find data and find decent data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to put one devil's advocate after running out and being sick with my migraine. Um, I think we are missing one point slightly, though. I mean, data science is more than statistics. I mean, statistics is necessary for data science, but it's not all of data science. And I think what we need to rethink as a discipline is what we need to take out of our statistics training in order to teach our students computational methods to the degree that they're actually useful. And I think that's a big challenge, and we're kind of to a large extent, teaching them t-tests, tables, things that um, our great grandfathers and great grandmothers could have talked to. And no, I, I think you've absolutely put your finger on it. We, we've, uh, I think, both Gordon and I have said this is what data science should include, and basically included statistics and bits of computer mm -hmm. science. 
we have to, you, you can't do that. You have to say, so what bits of statistics are you not going to teach? I think that's a very good point. Yeah, yes. I, I, I think I'm just saying that it's not even a new point. It's the emphasis on it has changed. But the, the, um, it's a point that's been around for a long time and we haven't been paying enough attention to it. I, th I think this, or the discussion of data science is important because it's drawing attention to it in a way that, that hasn't been as acute. One of the things that, uh, you know, when I did this, this work that we were talking about before, and this was in 2011, data science wasn't so current as a term, and the recruiters I talked to were mostly people recruiting to areas which would probably not even now be considered to, to, to be data science in the sense of big data and so on. They were mostly pharmaceutical recruiters and people like that. Um, and what they were saying was, there are skills missing in the graduates, people coming with a first degree involving statistics or a taught masters, and what was missing was essentially those soft skills, the communication skills, and so on, that Gordon described it. And, and, and they said, you know, the problem we would have with placing somebody straight off an MSc is that they would not possess those skills. If you got somebody who'd been working in industry for a couple of years, um, they might be not quite as up-to-date on the statistical stuff, they might even have forgotten some of it, but they did develop those other skills, and that's what they were on about. Now, if they're saying that's a lack, and there's all this um, computer science uh, material that needs to be got in as well, well, what do we leave out? Does anyone have any suggestions? Part of that is also there's another lack, and if you get people in business who have soft skills, they need to understand enough of the high-level quantitative methods to speak to quantitative people. So if you're coming from another side, yes, we need to learn to communicate and to formulate ourselves simply. And if we understand asymptotics, we need to boil down that to the basic point that makes the method work or not work in a certain setting. But if you come from the other side and you're now having to interact with quantitative methods, how can you get so much of an overview that you know the right person to go to? Right. There was, a there was, a, there was one at the back first, I think, in fairness. Yeah. I, I think differences between, uh, from how I see the civil service works, which is fairly limited exposure, from certainly how the private sector works, a major difference between that and academia, um, is that academics, to a certain extent, you can do what you want. Your research programs are actually, you know, the, the things you choose to research are what you want to choose to research. They're the things in which you're expert. In the private sector, I earn my living, uh, as I did when I was at employed as an internal analyst in companies, actually answering the boss's questions. There's mo and in the civil service, I guess it's much the same. Your political masters or your permanent secretaries will say these are the important things. So conceptually, it's not that different. But believe me, it is very different. If you as an academic can, can choose to publish in JASA or JAMA or wherever, because this is your particular area of interest, and you have that choice to a large extent. 
Whereas in a commercial environment, in, in many other environments, you don't. You work on what your boss tells you to. Can you take a question from here? Yes. Um, earlier on, you are talking about the lack of skills of um, people leaving the university. If there was more collaboration between private sector and universities, do you not think those, those skills could be um, foreseen in advance, what the, what, what the lack would be? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is a problem that's difficult to organize, but I'm sure you're right that there would be a lot of gains if we did more of that. And I think the extent to which it's done differs hugely from one university to the next. Um, I, I mean, I think it's also true to say there are different attitudes on this. I sometimes talk to um, colleagues in academia and outside academia whose view would be that actually we shouldn't be worrying about those sort of things. Um, you know, the main, main thing is to get you know, the, the, the fundamental the mathematical and statistical and perhaps bits of computing base down there, and the rest can sort of follow naturally or something when, when, when people eventually go out into the workplace. I mean, personally, I don't agree with that, but it's actually quite a common view in academia, and that, that does get in the way, I think. I, I think one of the problems is that universities are businesses, and so they will respond to market forces. So the drive will come from people who want to study a particular discipline. So, for instance, you get more people taking masters in mathematical finance than there are jobs for them when they graduate. Mm. So it may be better if it was the other way around that the universities decided you know, how many students they were going to take on what courses, but they respond to market forces. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, that's not as bad as the photography situation. My daughter studied photography, and at the time, the UK was turning out more graduates in photography each year than there are people employed in the whole of the EU as photographers. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't work in photography. So. <laughs> um, now, I think we've probably got to end the session now, so if you could just join me in thanking the speakers and hoping Sophia feels better.